Hey guys, this is Mark Natividad over at Electric Dreams. And I'd just like to remind you, don't forget to like, subscribe, and make all the good comments that you like so we can keep providing these great videos for you. Now that that's said and done, sit back and enjoy the video. I want to ask, I w actually, I want to ask everything about the go kart because I know that you, I overhear make comments, I overhear telling stories, but you never told me anything about it. Okay. And I know that you have a, well, your family have a very important participation in the whole deal. Yeah, going back uh, to the beginning, 1957 Christmas, uh, Duffy Livingston and Bill, I think it was Dobrik, they uh, owned uh, GP Muffler in Monrovia. And a guy named uh, Art Ingalls, who worked for uh, Curtis, had developed the first go kart. Okay, Curtis, they, Curtis, like Curtis, Curtis Indy? cars in, okay. in Indy, and he went out and he would drive it around the parking lot at the Rose Bowl. And so Duffy evidently saw it or heard of it, and he liked it, and so they developed what was a go kart 400, a 400. It was a kit. And it was okay. on the advertised on the back of Rod and Custom magazine, the little book, not okay. the big one, but the little book they called it, on the back cover, one hundred twenty nine ninety five, and you bought the kit. All everything was there, but you had to weld everything together. It came <laughs> with a Clinton, a real man's kit. Yeah, a Clinton uh, <laughs> A four hundred motor. So those motors are sur surplus from the war, right? Some no, sort of... that that was actually a lawnmower motor, the Clinton. Oh, okay. Yeah, the motors that were surplus for the war were the West Bend. The small ones, the 750s, and then the 810s were the 8.1 cubic inch motors. Uh, and then McCullough, which was early on, was the fast motors. They were just uh, chainsaw motors. But uh, anyway, getting back to Christmas. So my dad, a guy named Harry Maeda, and Stan Oles, we had a garage. Remind me, I'll tell you a story about the pit, but with a pit in it. And so they're welding this go-kart together putting the kit together and my sister we had a six foot high fence because my dad didn't want anybody seeing the backyard so they're uh, she's taking names of all the kids I mean there was probably 60 70 kids that wanted to drive this and I don't know how the word got around because I didn't tell anybody and that was here in El Segundo that was actually no that was in uh, Van Essen Imperial 2109 West 112th Street which is close I mean it's just Three and a half, four miles four from miles here. Out. But uh, so then when we got done. And that was your house? That was at the house, yeah. Okay. And that, uh, so what happened is they would drive the cart around the block. And that's when I think I screwed my knees up because I was trying to stay <laughs> up with them on my bike just to make sure they didn't crash it. But everybody got to drive it. And that was the very first go karts for sale. Go kart engineering, which actually built the first track uh, in L.A. Uh, was out in uh, Irwindale, okay. where Irwindale Raceway is now. That's where the go-kart company and the track was. I've got a bunch of slides at home that I probably should have okay, somebody. But the timeline is not clear for me. So back 60. That's 57. 57. 57. That was Christmas of 57. So what happened, we so went and they were racing at Eastland parking lot, which was out off the 10 freeway. Mm -hmm. And... I couldn't run because I was a kid. They didn't want kids running, that, so it was adults only. That was not 57. That's 58. Okay. 58. So what, what is the beginning of go-karting? The beginning of go-karting was... Well, it was actually 56 was Art Engel, the first go-kart. His wife, uh, Doris, had it in uh, the living room in Leisure World because Art passed away a long time ago. But she was still alive uh, at least a year ago that I remember. Mm-hmm. And an interesting story going back to uh, early years, uh, a guy named Jimmy Yamani worked at McCullough. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, uh, when you visited uh, Bruce Myers, oh, there yeah. was that go-kart there, and that was a car that won the world championship that Jimmy Yamani had driven to, to the world championship in the Bahamas, Nassau. What, what, which year was that? That was, I think, 61. Okay, so we it. have like a four or five year development to have a like <coughs> real well, competition on that. Oh, but they, they were racing. They were actually racing in the parking lot. They'd set cones up in the parking lot okay. at Eastland. So I think it took like two weeks. As soon as, <coughs> as, so, as, soon as you have oh, two go-karts. Right <laughs> Excuse me. 
<laughs> exactly. Susan. Right away. In fact, since I couldn't race, Hollywood Park, which is gone now, SoFi Stadium is Thinking. out there in the casino. But the, the racetrack had a huge, I mean, parking lot. So we used to go out there and, and race around with the go-karts. And, I mean, you could go fast because there was nothing in your way but trees. And if you hit a tree, you're stupid. But oh, wow. didn't happen. And, and dead. Well, probably. yeah. <laughs> but but the, the funny thing about that was, and this is in the really rudimentary days, because we didn't have chain guards. We didn't have <clears throat> mufflers. So you had an open exhaust. They were loud. And actually, my, my best memory of Hollywood Park is when I'm running around and the chain broke, hit me in the arm, and I still got a scar back here. That hurt. <laughs> But we also went to uh, Northrop parking lot, which is now gone. That was on 120th in Crenshaw in Hawthorne. Okay. Interesting story about that is we had a cart. It was the go-kart cart. And we had a flag on the back that said Southwest LA Go-Kart, just the initials, and then a little picture of a cart and a flag. Well, we were driving in a round we'd drive it around there to get business one of the businesses or i should say <clears throat> one of the customers that we acquired was beach boys okay yeah. they grew up just down the street from there off of north of 120th yeah. and uh they have like a statue or something, something well there yeah there is over there there's a memorial there memorial, yeah. but so they saw it and so actually we did a card this is when they were all together the first time and the interesting part is then Because of the cart, they were putting on a concert. It was a small one. It was in the parking lot where the Ralph's Market was on Imperial and Crenshaw. So I got to go right up by the stage. You know, that was something. And I was like 12 years old. <laughs> but, you know, and even, but I can definitely say that Murray, the dad, he was a control freak. I mean, it was interesting right. to see him back then. And I, I didn't realize it at the time. But yeah, looking back, I, story, yeah, right? he just... He controlled, but the best part is about four years later when uh, Al Jardine had to go to Vietnam, mm -hmm. they brought another neighbor, uh, hood member. How old were your father back then when they started the company? You're talking about Murray? Or? No, your father. Oh, my dad? Well, let's see, he was born in 23, so that was 50. 30 something. 34, 35. Yeah, well, he was a policeman, yeah. so and he always had an interest in automotive. That's why we had the pit in the garage. In fact, the interesting story about the pit is, if you ever bring it up even to this day to my mom, she cringes. She actually, we had a Rambler station wagon, and she drove into the pit. Luckily, it didn't go all the way in. <laughs> she got stopped before she did, but my dad, oh. <laughs> you hear talk about foul language. He, oh, God. But she still, to this day, if you bring it up, she hates it. <laughs> she's she's 90, going to be 99 years she's old. 99? Yeah, her birthday's in January. This, is she living with you? No, no. She broke her uh, leg two, yeah, just two years ago. Oh, And so she, she's so vain that she just didn't like it because she had to have 24-7. She had to have help to use a porta potty. And so my sister decided to take her back to Mississippi. So she's back oh. there, but she likes it. So she's been there now two years, and she's gone through the seasons. And she's 99. She, her, the, her worst problem is that she's got immaculate degeneration, so her eyesight. But she still doesn't need any help getting yeah. around, but it's just peripheral vision. But so getting back to the go karts. Uh, yeah, there is a there is a timeline question for you. So 56, they put out the 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 art put out the, the yeah. The, and the, the, the would, and they founded Coretta, sort of an interesting side sideline. Art Engels and Lou Borelli were the partners, and this this cart was an immaculate cart. I mean, beautiful if workmanship. You put, if you put together well, because you need to weld everything <clears throat> together, right? Well, yeah, but I'm, th these guys built just a beautiful cart. Didn't handle as good as the ones that my dad was making. In fact. Uh, Stan Oles and Harry Mead uh, and Wally Baines, my dad, mm -hmm. came up with the moniker B-O-M, mm -hmm. the bomb. And they built custom carts, uh, so, and they handled really good. My dad used to build, bend all the tubing and weld it up and everything. And then Harry Maeda used to run a Villers, which was a B. They had like A class, which is the slower class, and then B was the faster, and C was the fastest. And Stan Oles ran a drone motor out of a drone back then, back in 59, 60. So they all had specials. It's still a little complicated for me to understand because somebody was racing a cart, a go-kart with a lawnmower thing 
a Rose Bowl. And those guys came up, okay, we're, we're going to put a kit together and sell. Well, that was Duffy and, and Bob. And that was 56. And That then was, they, no, actually 57 at Christmas. They was when we, <coughs> and they got formed in 57. Okay, and then you, your father and my Well, what happened is then they formed Go-Kart with a couple other partners, established a company, and he was the first dealer. So Go-Kart was a brand? Go-Kart, yes, was a brand. I didn't know that. <coughs> yeah. In fact... That's one cart that, order. yeah, okay. that's one uh, cart that probably uh, Scott should get because he has darts. He's got McCullough carts and some other carts. Okay, so around So he became a dealer, and they built a track out there, so it was probably done in 59. Okay. And they, they were trying to get too big too soon. And they ended but up before that, before that, when your father got involved, that's what I'm interested to know. He got one of those kits in Christmas of '57, he told me, and then you put together in your garage with your pit and everything. The, we, the Rumbler. We pits. went and ran around Hollywood <laughs> Park and Northrop parking lots, and because there was no tracks to run on. So, uh, so, first, so '57 was the, the the year of having fun with that go kart. That for me, and then Eastland parking lot. They raced actually organized races. And did you enter any race with that? I cart? couldn't because I was a was kid. They young. wouldn't let kids in 1950. I didn't start racing until late '59 or early '60 when. There was a track but a, but up a, behind. But, but at that point, your father had the company already. He was yeah. He was stuff. he was selling go karts. Yes, put him that's, together. That's the click that I'm trying to understand. How your father, as a policeman, got a kit, fixed it together, saw that people had fun with it. So I can make money out of My this. dad was ambidextrous. Okay, he could hammer, do all kinds of things either hand. So he was into cars. My dad, uh, uh, Joe McClellan, who was one of the founding members of Ford Pirates Obsolete, which was a big company back in the day. Uh, my dad ended up putting exhaust system on his car for him because my dad was very capable and we had the pit and it was easy to do. But he was mechanically inclined. He, he was very good. In fact, he ended up buying a brand new 50, I think 57 Ranchero. And the first thing he did was take the motor out and put a Cadillac motor in it. And this was 1957, first 58. Thing. They didn't have any G adapters. Out. He made <laughs> everything. And I've got the article. And it said Fordalac. The only problem is, it is Fordalac. Well, because the Cadillac and yeah, Ford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> the people that did the framing for me didn't understand, so it doesn't say Fordalac. It doesn't match up. But my dad wouldn't let me take it back to him. He was because it was neat. And I read it. I'm reading it now, <laughs> 20 years later. That's just thinking, cool. boy, he really knew what he was doing because he had to yeah. make all these adapters and everything. And, and it was a nice car, black. There, there was not not many tools out there to make this. Well, kind of stuff. well, they had the tools. They just didn't have the the quality or or the technology back yeah, then. No. But I mean, that's just like guys used to use lead and did a lot better job than guys using Bondo. But Bondo's so good today, they don't have a problem. Yeah, what was so, the name? What was the name of their father's car? <coughs> Wally? Wally. 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 Well, actually, it was, you know, he was Junior Walter Lawrence Baines Junior. That's why you're the third. My grand, yeah, and, and my <laughs> grandmother called him Bud. Bud. So the go kart company was Wally. That was Southwest LA go karts. South LA. And then what happened? We we would go when I started running. We ran at a track that first track was uh, Butler Speedway. It was behind uh, J.C. Agajanian's Ascot. Ascot. Yeah, Gard in Gardena. Gardena. Yeah. And that's you know where... that he was here, right? Chris. Yeah, that's true. Chris yeah. here. But so anyway, I raced there. And then there was uh, some brothers, the uh, Deming brothers, who put together a track called uh, Trojan out in uh, Southgate. And those guys were sort of interesting because when all those beach blanket movies were going on, Mm -hmm. A couple of them used go-karts, and they provided all the go-karts. <clears throat> but the interesting part is, because of that and the tie-in they had, there was people that would come out there and race like Pernell Roberts, who at the time was Bonanza. Okay. And then they had a guy who was one of the probably most famous uh, character actors from Westerns called Royal Dano. Royal Tall, Dano. thin guy. He raced out there. Dano. Okay. But uh, so anyway... That was the track. And then they had a third track that was out in Agora called Wizen's Corner, which is the, the building still there. And then... And you're uh, talking, we're talking about dirty tracks, right? No, no. We're talking about paved tracks. These guys, they built the tracks. Even the, the one in Ascot was paved? Yeah, the one behind Ascot was paved. Oh. In fact, that eventually, Butler, it was interesting because Jim Butler, 
thing I remember about him is Sherry was his wife, really a pretty gal, and he was just the biggest cheater out there. He used to run 8.1 cubic inch motors in the six six. Oh. Cubic inch oh, class. Cheated be- on the racer. Oh, oh yeah, God. but I mean, so I was thinking, I hope those people are not alive still. Oh, it, <laughs> it was just he like is, oh, he was a cheater. He, no. he might be watching this by his wife on the couch. No, I no, that's why <laughs> I tell him to his face. Everybody did because oh, I mean, he was enforced. No, the but rules. if it's a cheater on a race, I don't care. It's just like if it's, the way that you put it was very funny because you start to talk about the gal and then you come over, oh, he was a cheater. You say, oh my God, he has a nice gal. So he didn't like- last long there. <laughs> and then Tony, uh, I can't remember Tony's last name, bought it and became Harbor Speedway. Mm-hmm. And that lasted for probably 10, 12 years. The, the biggest problem with Tony was is he... Uh, and Harbor Speedway was just go-karts? Yeah, it was go-karts, yeah. Okay. But Tony... Uh, so basically you find the empty parking lot and... Figure well, out the circuit. The, that's what you did before the tracks. Mm. And then a fourth track locally was uh, built in Oxnard by Yashio Yagi. <laughs> what is that? Well, that just was the guy's name that built it. It was, on, it was on sand. And uh, Kenny was, Yagi was a competitor of mine. He was a kid my age, real good. And then George Ito was another competitor. George, to this day, I still think, is racing in like quarter midgets and stuff at Ventura Speedway. George was good too. Little guy, stocky, but man, he could drive. He went on to do good things. But those were the tracks. So we'd go around here. And then we also and that's would go up late, north. Late 50s, early 60s. Yeah, 60s. Okay. And we'd go and around. And then you were racing under your father's company, Flag. Under Southwest LA Go Kart, yes. Okay. And, and then in night, we went to uh, Pueblo, Colorado. There was nationals there in 1962. But when, when that's such interruptive, but when. It's hard for me to understand because I know that as soon as you got the second car, these guys start to compete. But when your father decided to, be, to, to turn into a business and not and decide to leave the police Well, spot. because it was just something that he liked doing, and so it was so a hobby. So he figured out I can make money out of this. Yeah, and he did. He, and, he made when, it. And, and when he was planning to do this, he was looking for a market for recreation or for racing? Because well, those are two, two different, no, two different things, we right? Were do, we were racing only. The, 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 there were so many carts. That probably was 200 cart manufacturers back then. Jim Rathman, who Scott has one of his carts. Okay. It was a POS cart. It was terrible. Didn't handle work. I mean. But, so you guys were interesting about performance on the day one. Well, only, definitely. Speed. Yeah. That was it. The, initially, the first year, no. We just go out and have fun. But we... My dad was still racing, but for me, I couldn't race. So when I got to start racing, then it got interesting for me. So I started learning about all the different stuff, and I could build the motors and everything from probably uh, 10 years old. I mean, okay. my dad still did them, but I could do them. And yeah. then what happened, uh, 62 was a race, national race. Go-Kart Club of America was formed as part of really Go-Kart, but it was the national organization. They organized races all over the country. And 62, there was a race in Pueblo, which I went with my dad to help him. I was his pit crew. But he, uh, for some reason, I didn't race. I still don't remember why. But he raced. He finished second to a guy named Dick Connors and ran real good. But he just wasn't fast enough to beat him. And then Bill LaRock won and Bill Willard won. These were two other local guys from Mm -hmm. L.A. They ended up forming a partnership called Inglewood Cart. Okay. So... In 1965, they had to sell it. And this was 65, so if you remember uh, the swing in the 60s, Bill LaRock and Bill Willard ended up swapping wives. These were the partners in the go-kart, so that's why they had to end up selling it. So my dad bought it in 65. (laughs) Wait, what? (laughs) Yeah. Well, don't you remember, what was it? What was the movie? Uh, Something Ted and Alice. Uh, That's a move based on this. Well, people? no, no, not this. Okay, but I mean, well, it's about amazing. swapping. There's four, four couples, four people, two couples. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Bill LaRock. And they had partners. Fr- he had a front end alignment shop. And then Bill Willard uh, was an automotive shop. They got this partnership and formed the go-kart. They were doing very well because and then they were day... good drivers and they, they, they built good motors for customers. They did very well. But. They swap wives somehow. Well, from now on, we're just going to talk about that. Forget about go-karts. <laughs> How is this possible? Like, oh, like, okay, we're I don't doing know good, the details. Doing I wasn't there. Let's celebrate. You're doing good on business. 
Oh, maybe. We should... I, weird. I, and, how about, how they about... married each of them. That's what's funny. How about the housing situation? Who goes to where? Uh, you know what? That's a good question. I never <laughs> did a ask good him question, that. Right? I didn't ask him that one. And <laughs> I, I, I was good furniture. friends with both of them. It's like how you how you split furniture. You need a good spreadsheet. Look, I'm going to stay. I like my bed better than yours, but I tried that one too. So Well, they slept oh, in both. God. So, they, you know, they should have been at home on either one. <laughs> oh, God. So <laughs> so anyway, they had to sell it. My dad was in a position to buy it, so he bought it. And okay. that was 65. And the interesting part was... And that was Ingl Ingl Inglewood Car. Inglewood up on La Brea, 1307 okay. uh, North La Brea. And what happened, there was a riot in Watts in 1965. 65, yeah. I right. heard about it. So an interesting story about that one is my dad was going to... Bass Lake fishing and the night before it actually happened or when it did start my mom was watching the news and she heard this voice say you inward drop that bottle because they were they were in a gas station and they were making Molotov cocktails anyway that was my dad and so he got home and he wasn't available he didn't have to go in and and do it because he was on vacation so he said if anybody calls i'm not here but he didn't go he stayed in case you know they had to have him but they didn't oh. and the, the next memory was going to 77th police station and picking him up so he could go out to uh harbor cartway and race on a sunday and as i go in there <laughs> we got all these cops on the roof with the riot guns this was like two weeks later and they checked me out go well, what are you here for well i'm here for wally my dad so they checked it out but that was the so anyway as a result of that he was a cop and he worked he worked the graveyard shift he'd go in like at uh 10 o'clock at night and he'd get off at like six in the morning he'd go to the cart shop work on stuff i was had originally because of the riots i didn't go to washington high because it was a, a integrated school and my mom and dad said we don't want you going there they sent me a catholic school mount carmel and the bad news about Mount Carmel was is that I wasn't Catholic, but I went there. I had to take religion at that place. Oh, wow. And the worst thing was is the grading system was 95 was an A. So here I am. I had all my grades between 90 and 95, and I got straight Bs. Oh. Really. So I said, this sucks. I am not <laughs> staying here. So my grandmother lived in Hawthorne, so I went to Hawthorne. But as a result, I... I had all the credits I'd taken, and because of religion, I had enough credits I could go on what was called then the 4-4 four -four plan. Mm -hmm. You work four hours at, at school, and then you go to work and work four hours at a business. So I was working for my dad. So what happened is I'd get off at noon. It was only 10 minutes away. I'd go up to the car shop. He'd take a nap. He'd sleep for three hours. Then he'd get up again, and he lot. did that for two years because he retired in 66. So 65 and 66, he was getting three hours sleep a night. So if at, he was lucky. At that age, you were kind of an active, oh, active I was role on the, on 16, the company, right? 16, 17, yeah. So you're doing business. Oh, yeah, no, I was, I was doing everything. I was doing the shipping. I was doing all the stuff. Interesting story about the cart shop. In 1968, Christmas, we were closed on a Monday. We were open on Tuesday. Through Saturday. The reason we were open Saturday is because guys would go out to the racetrack and they might need parts. Might we were closed on Sunday because we raced, and then we were closed on Monday to sort of recover, clean stuff up, and, and get ready. And that shop was already on the Inglewood. That cart. was in Inglewood, North okay. La Brea, initially. <clears throat> but so anyway, 68, we used to sell a lot of fun carts and mini bikes at Christmas because we'd put them in the window. There was a little display area, and we got a lot of sales. So this woman on Monday, is a black lady she comes across knocks on the door and my dad says tell her to come back tomorrow we're closed i said no that's okay because i thought i recognized who it was and i said i'll take care of her i'll let her in it's tina turner <laughs> and tina and i across the street had bought a, a furniture store and turned it into the studio they actually had a recording studio tina so, and mike yeah that was b before they broke up but anyway so what happened is she ended up buying uh three fun carts and two mini bikes so I had to deliver them to her house up in Baldwin Hills but and the the main thing I remember about her is she sits on this mini bike and she had a short skirt on of course and I'm just thinking this is crazy what are you doing that for but <laughs> nice lady 
Yeah. So did she did she sign a poster saying "Simple the best"? No, no, but she could do it, right? Oh, was she? Well, <laughs> if we would have only known. But I mean, yeah. it was. And we used to have a, a bunch of different people come in. Another guy that would come in a lot uh, was the drummer for the Monkees. Okay, Mickey Dolans. Pretty nice cool. guy. Very nice guy. Pretty he cool. came in, was a customer. Another one was not as famous, but the voice is very famous. His father was George Finnerman. Mm -hmm. George Finnerman was the announcer on Groucho Marx show, You Bet Your Life. And he also did a lot of radio work. But uh, his son worked on Dallas, the TV series. So he was behind the scenes, but he was another nice guy. A lot of, so we had a lot of people like that that would come in the card shop. But did you guys put your brand like up? Because you're talking about they have a window and everything, you guys promoting like that? Oh, yeah. We, we would handle different carts. At one time or another, we handled like Red Devil carts, which were built in Montana. Then we had, uh, oh, shoot, the cart from uh, Texas. Uh, I got a blank on it right now. Anyway, we handled that, and we would display them, and we'd race them. Yeah, because normally those shops, the the usual cost customers are just people who are racing, looking for parts and looking for improvements on new carts. Not like ordinary people looking for go karts. No, th that's not true. People would come in because they'd have a friend or they go to a race and they'd want a cart, so they'd come to buy a cart and we'd outfit them with everything from helmet, jacket, all, all the way down to a starter. Used to have a starter because we went away. Originally, it was direct drive. There's no clutches. Mm -hmm. Then we got clutches, sophisticated clutches, which ran in oil as a bath. Then disc inside and weights that got very sophisticated. But so you needed a starter. Do you still have some of those pieces at your collection? I wish I did. No. Nothing. Nothing. And, and another thing my dad did when we were at cart shop is he made his own carts. So one of them, he I don't know how I came up with the name, but he had uh, bonsai, bonsai was the name. So he had a sprint car which was sit up. Then he had a bonsai enduro cart which you laid down and raced. And then another cart that he'd made was a maxi cart. These carts handle real well. Uh, one of the customers of how the maxi cart. How much is worth a cart like that? today? Today? <sighs> Do you see them for sale on eBay? And stuff you know like what? That? I've looked a couple times. There's, there's probably 300 of them out there, but I've never seen one for sale because I've done searches and I can't find them. But we, when the, the McCullough Motors, which we sort of skipped over because the rotary valve motors came in from Italy and just they were dominant, so the McCullough Motors went away, and we threw away all our inventory. And if we had it now, at one time, some of those parts that we threw away probably are worth a hundred bucks or like a block mm -hmm. or more today. But it was just, you know, you had to stay up, and we it was a well, small shop. Do you feel for not owning one of those? Like, yeah. In yeah. fact, I have a friend that's included in uh, the lunch group, uh, Eddie Gabaldabon, and he's got a cart. It's my dad's cart, and he's so proud of it because he added a lot of stuff onto it, like Nerf bars and stuff like that, but his welding is atrocious. I hope he doesn't <laughs> see this. But I want to get that cart. I told just him to I want that it. cart. Well, no, it just it looks so bad. The first thing I do is tear it off. <laughs> but it, it, he's got it, and that's the only one I've ever seen. I told him I want that, and now he's on his great-grandkids riding it. Okay. Do you still have the capabilities to, to fix a cart like that? Uh, I, one thing I never did do and I should have done is learn to weld because my dad would have taught me, but I just, I didn't think I had the need. Because uh, after that, you've, you've, you worked at Boyd Connington. <coughs> well, Boyd Connington is another thing. Let me tell you a story about, uh, what we had done. So anyway, we sold the carts and then to try and diversify, my dad, uh, decided he's going to carry some motorcycles. So we decided to go look at these Motobetta motorcycles. That's 68, 69 probably. Uh, maybe even 71. Okay. And the problem was is uh, in 68, it was 68, you're right, because I, I couldn't spell, so I was in dumbbell English at El Camino. And I'm acing this class. Dumbbell English? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I never I, that. well, that's – and I'm acing this class. Well, I'm getting A's on everything, and, but – I would always do something with my dad because, and so I'd miss Mondays because we always seemed to do stuff because they have to do stuff. And the teacher told me, I think I had eight absences, but I'm getting an A in the class. And he goes, one more absence and you're out of here. I go, okay. Well, my dad wanted to go look at the Motobetta motorcycle. So I went with him and come back on the next day, which was probably Wednesday. What are you doing here? Well, I'm here for class. You're out of here. I got a non-attendance F. 
And the worst thing was, is my left knee, I had a chip bone cartilage that I got, and I had to get that removed. So now, I only class I took was health ed, and I missed two tests because I was went to pick up my future wife and her sister. They were t my wife's a twin at El Camino, and I bent my knee too far and it started bleeding. So the doctor said, "You're staying in bed for three weeks." And I'm gonna miss the class anyway. So well, but the, so the problem was I didn't take the test, and the teacher wouldn't let me make them up. So now I had a D in health ed, two two units, and an F. Now I'm on probation. So then I had my neck operated on my thyroid removed. And again, I had a problem where I just, you don't want to do anything when you're not feeling good. So I didn't. And so I, I, I didn't maintain a C average because I got a D in the class and I didn't care about grades. So 68 was not a good year for. So I had to sit out a year. So my first year I had two units uh, of uh, D and then I had an F for non-attendance F. So I had a total of 10 units and my grade point average was terrible. Yeah. But then after that, I, so I, that's three, three semesters. That's when I made up my mind I better get going. And I actually went into, took accounting, and I was very good with numbers. So that's what I ended up doing, dealing know with that. numbers. Yeah. So you run your shop with your dad since you were like 13, 12, or even earlier because you guys first. Well, we were doing it at the house. Yeah, yeah seven and, years old. And too. we were racing all over the country. So you, you stay working for your dad for two, like a third or something? Yeah. No. Uh, actually, what happened is... Uh, I went to SC. First two years, I went to El Camino. I transferred to SC, and then I went to work 1974. So I worked for my dad up until 74. Okay, okay so from 65 to 70, I worked at the cart shop. And I, was, I wasn't I was racing at the end, but I was going in and helping him. And I also was working for this teacher at El Camino because I ended up scoring the best on his accounting test, and he'd always offer them a job. So I got really good experience from writing checks uh, all the way up to it, doing the books, closing the books, and then he would do the tax returns. Hugo Dallas was his name. So that really put me ahead of all these other people when I started at Touche Ross. They didn't have a clue what a general ledger. I knew what everything was, and I had yeah. done it. So I had, I was way ahead of them. But, uh, so anyway, I worked for my dad until then, and I uh, worked at Touche Ross for two years, which is now uh, Deloitte and Touche. It was one of the big eight back then. But the problem was is I had two busy seasons. So back to 74. Okay, so then 74. And, and then what happened is uh, one of my clients was Kilroy Industries, which happens to have buildings in El Segundo, the uh, DirecTV buildings, which are now, I think, AT&T, it says on Probably, it. Probably, yeah. On Douglas mm -hmm. and Imperial. And they also have the buildings on Sepal, but I went to work for Kilroy Industries, which is a client. I stayed there for 11 months. And it just was too much work. We had, I had a couple of girls that were working. I went as assistant controller. Mm -hmm. And one of the girls got the job because her dad was the Commodore Long Beach Yacht Club. And Jim Kilroy is a world famous, was a world famous sailor. He used to sell the maxi yachts, uh, the Kealoa, and was won races all over the world. So that's how she got her job. But cute girl, but she couldn't, she couldn't reconcile the bank account. No. One time she had every reconciling item, but she didn't have them right. So I'd always have to come behind her and fix it. And then we'd get like three, 400 checks a month because we had a lot of properties. And I had another gal, Nancy Martin, who we had Burroughs accounting machine and she was accounts payable. And oh, she, that, that's the one with a lot of... Well, it, you'd, you'd do it and then you had cards that had a strip on the side and then go down in the machine and print so over it and then come back and it would remember what was there. Well, the problem complicated is... Complicated times. Oh, yeah. It Come was on. But anyway, it worked. Because okay. when I was accounting, we used to have 16 column and 24 column. We did everything by pencil and we erased to do all that adding. Now, of course, you have Excel or, you know, they had Lotus 1, 2, 3 before that. Yeah. So anyway, I just couldn't take it because she, she, she used to come in and I'd trying to help her, but also telling her, you're not doing your job. You got to get with it. And she start crying. I say... You're wasting your time. Well, Carlos Carlos does, does the same. So it's, it's Well, always, I told her. I said, yeah. you know what? I go, it's not going to do any good, so you can turn it off because I can care less. I go, but the worst thing about her was <coughs> Nancy off. was in the gutter with her language. She was worse than a sailor. <laughs> so her mouth. But she ended up transferring to our Washington, Seattle. The We had towers, just like the two on Imperial. Up okay. in Seattle was the first ones that Kilroy had built. She went to work for us there. And the general, the VP manager up there was uh, Rick Anderson. 
they ended up living together and she actually beat him up she was she, she was <laughs> built oh nancy <laughs> yeah nancy nancy martin so anyway they ended up arresting her i don't know what happened oh to her oh my god <laughs> it didn't matter she, she was, was in the she gutter. was really worse than a sailor yeah, she was terrible. <laughs> so anyway, I said, you know what? So I'm out of here. So I told him in. I told him at the August. I said, okay, I'm leaving. I just there's too much work. How in do it. you remember the month? Jesus. Well, because what happened is I said I'll, I'll get everything done. You know, I'll ah, finish okay, it. So, then, so what happened? We get into the end of September, and I've still got stuff to do. So I'm still working at the end of October doing stuff, and I said, okay, this is it. I'm done. Into November, I'm out of here whether the work is done or not. You can't keep giving me stuff to do. Yeah. And so I ended up leaving then. And then I went to work for my dad. Back to the rap? Yes. Because we, you know, it was, we thought it would work and uh, it didn't work. Did you get along with him or no? Oh, I got along fine with him. He was a cop. So I, that's why I give J Jim Williams a lot of uh, leeway, ex <laughs> except when he's yelling at people, put me in, put me in. <laughs> but I well, can, I understand that mentality. Well, Jim Williams cannot get anybody arrested right now, so we can just. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's so, <time> is <laughs> but, but, so he anyway. He can yell at how much, how, how long he can. He can. Like, we but can, the yeah. problem was that happened to be the worst year, 1977 of, for Cardi. Oh, for it was Cardi. terrible. Is that was the worst year he ever had. And I did the books for him. Well, so many companies came along in 10 years, right? And oh, there was companies come along, go in and out of you know, business. And I, I didn't know that Go-Kart was... It was huge back then. It was a company. I thought it was oh, the yeah, Go-Kart go -Kart was actually a manufacturer, one of the biggest, along with Rupp, who mm -hmm. Scott Bader has a Rupp cart. Mm -hmm. I think he might have two of them. But uh, Mickey Rupp, nice guy. Uh, so anyway, I went there and I just... It wasn't working. There wasn't enough money. And I just said, this ain't working. I got to find something. And I get a call from Bob Rogus, who was a guy I'd worked for before at Kilroy. We need help. We, we need you to go up to uh, audit the, thir the Twin Towers in Seattle uh, because we, we think they're playing games. So I went up there and did consulting. And, and sure enough, they were charging anything and everything to this these towers. And they had concrete runs that they never could have done in a day that they were charging. So, and the worst part is, a funny story is I'd written a memo to, and Jim Kilroy had uh, given it to uh, Bob Ba, the owner of Ba Construction. And they, they, the next time I went up there, all of a sudden, I'm a pariah. They won't help me or anything. But the first time, they're real nice, you know. But yeah. So I go, something's wrong. Well, Jim swore that he never did. And when we finally had a lawsuit against him, we're go I'm going through reviewing all this paperwork. And here I find this memo. And it's written, it says, Bob, look at all these different charges here. This is just the beginning. You know, Tip Jim of Kilroy, iceberg. I showed it to him. I go, Jim, is that your signature? Yeah. Well, I told you you gave it to him. And sure enough, what could he say that I had the proof? But that's how they, they treated those are, me. Those are two very different lines of work. You come from, a, from, from the shop de dealing with mechanics and shipping and dirt. And then it goes to a, almost an executive job of doing I was always good with numbers. When I was growing up, probably three, four years old, my mom, you know, in the bathtub is giving me these numbers to add up. So I was always good with numbers. And then after that job, when you start to work with cars? Well, what happened is, so I, I, I went back to work for Kilroy Consulting. Uh -huh. And I ended up staying there. And on December 11th, 1977, uh, Ralph Murphy, who was a, a IT guy at uh, Touche Ross, had helped Kilroy with some new systems. Well, they hired him to replace Bob Rogas because Bob was a nice guy, but he just wasn't getting the job done. So he, I'm in his office, and he's him and her. I go, "Do you want me to come to work for you, Ralph?" He goes, "Yeah, would you?" I said, "Well, make me a good enough offer. I might." So anyway, I ended up going to work for Kilroy again after 11 month, uh, you know, consulting, and, and I stayed there for. 37 more years <laughs> so that's where i worked and, and stayed so but i'd always been into cars because when i turned uh 16 which is 1965 my dad took me to uh we went looking for a car and we actually went on gauge street and a used car lot found a 1956 chevrolet two-door bel air hardtop it was a 265 with two color maybe it was turquoise, yeah, two-tone uh, turquoise and, and white. white. Yeah. And 
I, so, I know exactly which car is that. <coughs> I actually have the same car today. Oh, really? But it's not that's, it's not the car. It's yeah, the same, same color same combination, car. but it's a hot rod. Anyway, it was a stock car. So my dad, being a hot rodder, we ended up modifying it. It had a 265 motor with a power glide transmission, which was referred to as a, a slush box. It was slip and slide. They were terrible. Ended up putting a four-speed in it putting a 327 out of a 57 two-door wagon that he had and put the 265 in that because we were selling it and ended up but that was my first car and I've always been into cars because of my dad and the pit and he just always did that stuff and that's so after 40 years working with numbers and collecting from bad people no no i didn't know they were auditing us to try ah, and get okay. refunds back ah, okay. and i was the one that wouldn't let them being harassed by people then there you go <laughs> uh you decide to come back to cars well i was always with cars no i've been in cars i in 1988 i bought a 57 chevrolet nomad it's a two-door station how many cars, how many cars do you have in your collection now right now 16. What? And you never, you come, you always come with a CRV here? Yeah. Can you, can, you could brag a little bit. I, that's not my nature. <laughs> a little, just show a little bit. Oh, well, everything's kind of 50s and 60s, Chevy's well, and no, hot, actually, hot rods. <coughs> what happened is. You have a 32, right? Actually, I don't right now. That's oh, unusual. Okay. But I've got a 34 Ford. Okay. Three window coupe that was built by Boyd Coddington. Um, so the first car I, I, I had a the 56 and then the next car I had was the 64 Chevelle got stolen and I actually ended up getting it back and then my wife ended up needing cars so she took it but so basically I didn't do anything for probably four years because I, I was working and I didn't have time but I did buy that 57 two-door nomad and formed a friendship with a guy named Jim Hendricks. Not the. Not Jim. He's, he's Jim still alive The today. bassist, not the catalyst. Yeah, so it was real pretty black 57 <laughs> Nomad and then bought tons of cars from him and sold him cars, but really good friends to this day. And we, we get together. He, he, he moved up to uh, Calabasas. So the problem is, is that he's not around, but he comes down probably once every month where we have a lunch group on Wednesday that we have lunch. And he's one of the members. So it's a real good guy. So anyway, that was car, and then I've you're just bought diverting, cars. You're diverting about the fact that you have 16 cars and it's still well, with a okay. CRV here. Then, then I got, uh, Reed Dillard was a guy who raced for Englewood Kart Shop go-kart team. And uh -huh. Reed was, worked at Disneyland. So Reed, working at Disneyland, was friends with Boyd Coddington, who also worked there when he was getting started. So Reed had come up with the 32 two-door sedan. I heard something about Boyd working there. Yeah. Boyd was a very good machinist. They used to take care of all the rides and everything. At night, right? <coughs> after the well, pilot's yeah. pool. Yeah. But, I mean, the show made him look like a buffoon. I mean, they, they that stuff was all... When, I worked for Boyd for 10 months. and Oh, it's a TV show. So yeah. That's and, really and the producer, Ian, would be back behind talking to Dwayne, who was a shop foreman, and telling him what they wanted to do and... They had Boyd screw things up, you know. It was it was done for TV. Yeah, of course. And, and the first thing I would tell people, they say, "Well, yeah, but Dwayne." First thing I do is fire him. He's an a-hole. I go, "He's the nicest guy in the world." The only thing wrong with Dwayne is he swears too much, and that's not really a problem. Yeah, in fact, see back Nancy. No, no. <laughs> he was, no, Dwayne's a good guy, and to tell you how good he is. Uh, Tom Boyd had five or six of the uh, mentally challenged, or whatever you want to call the. the the mentally retarded kids okay. that they would he hired and he'd pay him and then they had a helper to come with him and make sure they do the work well one of them was tommy well after boyd shut down and then Dwayne on sundays would go pick tommy up and take him somewhere i mean he did this every week i mean he was just so i used to tell people well do you believe everything you see on tv yeah. it's just tv so you were there while they were filming that because that that yeah. that, that that show went stay, well that stay was on a, for that like was called American ten, Hot Rods almost ten years right uh, I don't know if it's ten years because they ran reruns my guess is probably seven seasons yeah. and the 20. death blow was uh, when they had a girl and uh, Joe Coddington complained that she didn't want the girl putting air in her tires or change, move, you know rotating the tires and they got so much bad PR on the From internet. That that uh, they didn't get 
an offer to renew. And the shop was here in South Bay, right? Like no, actually, Boyd <coughs> first shop was out on Lincoln in uh, Los Alamitos. Second one was in his house on in Orange, Orange. very close to uh, Knott's Bear, uh, um, Boyd Park Raceway. Oh, yeah. And then uh, his third shop was over in Stanton. Stanton, that's yeah, that's right. Stanton, yeah. and that was uh, on I want to say Monroe. And then the fourth shop was the big one, when he went bankrupt into the wheels, and that was on uh, Cerritos. But he was designing wheels too, right? Well, yes. They have a brand of wheels. I have yeah, Boyd. Well, that that's what really put put him out of business. But actually, the first person to do that, to give credit where credit due, was a guy called Little John Butera. Little John was this genius when it came to to motorcycles, cars, uh, mechanical stuff. And he is the one that actually took the center line wheel, took the centers out, and made his own machine, his own aluminum centers, and bolted them in. So he started that. And Little John was so successful at Indianapolis that every car for, I forget how many years, had his uh, oiling system on it. He came up with this oiling system that works. So, And then he, he just developed so many things. He had a 1927 Model T that he did in the 70s, and he took like a, I forget, was it a Riviera? Anyway, all the components of the car, independent front and rear, were put on this car, and he had all the interior, Everything all the components. It was just so in far advanced in front of its time. He was an innovator. In fact, he died either a month after or a month before Boyd. Two icons in the industry. Gone. Yeah. What was your role there? Well, originally it was supposed to go in and... Uh, be the uh, CFO. As it turned out, I ended up being more a bookkeeper. <laughs> and <clears throat> a couple interesting stories there is uh, when I'm there, I, Boyd said, well, we've got this car that we were building for uh, Vince McMahon's daughter-in-law. Vince McMahon being the world of wrestling, I think it was back oh, yeah. then, executive. And uh, his son was married to this gal, Mar Marissa. And it was put in storage because it just wouldn't pay. So he said, have him get the car. So I, he goes, I, okay, so I got a number. I called Vince, and I said, Vince, we got to return this car. You're not pay, paying. And not only that, even if you were paying, we wouldn't build it because the rates, this car was done three years ago. I now he's on TV. His rates have gone from $75 to $150 an hour, and the cars have gone from... 125 Twice. to 250. So I said, <clears throat> I said we, we couldn't build it. He said, well, I'd really like to get it done. Can, can you do something for me? I go, well, I'll tell you what. Let's agree here. We'll raise the hourly rate from 75 to, to 100 bucks. Yeah. And let's agree we'll raise the price from the 125 to 200. Let me go to Boyd. I think he'll agree to that. And I go to Boyd, and he goes. Well, of course we'll do it, but I told you to return the car. I said, well, we can do it. Let's sell it. You know, <laughs> or we can finish it. What do you want to do? And, of course, he wanted to finish it. Yeah. 200, 200K, sitting 200K. So we finished the car. Actually, I was gone, though, because it was causing me uh, acid reflux. <coughs> Excuse me. And I just, it was too much because I was going to Kilroy working from I used to go to Kilroy when they relocated from El Segundo on Douglas and Imperial to Olympic and Bundy. I'd go to work at 4 in the morning and work till 12, 1, 2, go home. Well, when I started working for Boyd in 76, uh, July, I was going from there out to La Habra, and it'd take me about 45 minutes to get there. So let's say 1 o'clock, and I'd stay till 8 o'clock. I was working I, almost. I'm kind of lost on the timeline. You say it's 76? No, 96. No. no. 19, <coughs> 2000 and 2006, 2006, July. 2006, yeah. Yeah. And so I was working 15, 16 hours a day. And there were some days I'd go in there on Saturday and Sunday. So I wasn't even having to try and get caught up and get stuff done because there was just so much. I was doing a little of everything. I was doing contracts. I was getting involved in insurance. I was doing a lot Probably of things. Probably the TV show as well. No, no. One thing I didn't want to do. In fact, I, I told him, I said, Boyd, I will not be on TV. I do yeah, not want to But still the be. contracts and the payments and everything. Well, yeah. but So anyway, 
The closest I came to getting on TV is when they had White Castle as a client who is a division of uh, Home Depot, like mm -hmm. tools and that. Mm -hmm. And the guy brought a sign out, a really neat sign, clock, and, you know, so I, he wanted to meet Dwayne. I said, well, Dwayne's up front, let's go. Anderson was his name. And Dwayne is having a tough fo phone call, and he says, no, let's don't interrupt. I go, no, come on. And, and I go, Dwayne, that, he goes, I don't have time for that. I go, fine, Dwayne. So, like usual, I mean, I don't care. I said, okay, come on, let's go get it. We took it, we hung it, and uh, I had uh, Mario hang it up. And I said, that's a little crooked, just turn it a little bit. And that part was picked up on the show. That's as close as I got to being <laughs> on it. was my voice. <laughs> Your it, voice. It brought back memories of my dad <laughs> and the Watts riots and his <laughs> voice being on TV. That's enough. There was a boom of those uh, reality shows, that Dash TV shows, because they're not TV shows. Uh, we have like Cheap Foods doing one. We have like American Chopper, uh, even Pimp My Ride on MTV. Oh, well, how about uh, Jesse James and Jesse Monster James. Garage? It was a little later, but yeah. No, actually, Monster Garage, he, he was the one that was doing the best. He was making the most money. He didn't do any of the work. And he benefited from the the swag, from all the, the shirts and all that stuff yeah. that he sold. And then he sold that off to Kmart. But he was one of the early ones. He was getting like, I'd heard, I'm sure it's probably right, like $90,000 an episode. And it was a week. And he didn't do much of anything. He just... Just, just now to the, work. Yeah, and the Tuttles, they were getting about 60 grand between the two of them per episode, but they took two, three weeks. Boyd was getting screwed because those there was like normally, initially, 150 hours of shooting time involved to, to get it down to the one-hour show, which is what they started. Then it expanded where it's probably 250 hours, and they did two or three parts. And Boyd was only getting five grand a week. And that was for everybody. So he, he was getting nothing. He was only getting forty thousand dollars for two months. For two months, yeah. Yeah, and that's a lot of a lot of uh, inconvenience inside of the shop. And the worst part about it was, is that there was guys that loved it, but then they didn't get work done. And guys that hated it, and yeah. they got a lot of work done. Yeah, so it's, it's you're right. Of, it was just it, <coughs> well, but but at some point his hourly rate came from seventy five to one hundred fifty. It That's did kind of. In fact, there was an interesting deal where he yeah, built it, a, even today. If you have a car made from that garage, it's worth some more money. Than well, it. it's not though. That's the sad part because I have three hot rods by Boyd, and I'm talking about these are cars built before the TV show, so there was not weeks, but this was years, years to build. And the prices, for some reason, haven't gone up. I don't know why, but I've got three cars right now that are Boyd cars. A 33, 34 three-window coupe, a 33 Victoria uh, High Boy, which is no fenders, mm -hmm. and a 37 Cabriolet, which is a full fender car. And, I mean, I like the cars. The workmanship on them is great. I drove the cars. Most of the guys that had those cars, I probably owned 20 Boyd cars. I drove them all over the country, and if I had problems, I'd pull them apart. I... Going to Bakersfield, I had a, a alternator bolt break on me. It was a low mount. It was not a good design. It was a, I had two other ones break, so I finally did away with it. Mm -hmm. Didn't wouldn't use it, but so I had to take the radiator out and get it fixed because uh, the thing blew up. Mm -hmm. And I so I took the whole fender. This was a, a car that was a Phantom car. It was a 1933. They called it the the uh, C400 because they. Ford built an A400, which was a Model A. It had a full back accordion top. Mm -hmm. They built a B400, 32, two-door sedan with a folding back top. And this one never was made, so they called it a Phantom. So, But that car, the, the hood, the radiator shell, the radiator, are all in the hotel room while I drove around to get They're the radiator right. fixed. Got it fixed, put it back in, put it together, went to the show at Bakersfield. Yeah. But the cars were built well, and, and they were, could be driven. People didn't drive them, but I did. Yeah. Let's talk about slot cars. How you got involved in slot cars? Oh, geez, slot cars. That's a, that's interesting. And I know that you were wearing this T-shirt to celebrate your Halloween Enduro win. Yes. <coughs> my, my victory that I got to keep uh, versus <laughs> the uh, Revo victory where oh, I got penalized five laps, <laughs> and I wasn't <laughs> even the fastest car there. <laughs> okay, your second victory. Uh, but, uh, but this one you raced with the he who not to be named? No, let's, let's go back. Let me, the interesting part of that is, is that my first job ever was at a slot car track on Western, which was just down the street. I didn't know that. 
never told me about that. Well, that's okay. why I'm telling you now. <laughs> okay, good. Anyway, You're I saving. went to Henry right. Clay Junior High, which is across from what was called at the time Western Avenue Golf Course, which is now Chester, Washington Golf Course. And down on 132nd Street, there was this buildings that were sort of stepped because the street went down okay. as you drove south on uh, Western. And it was a building, and Walter, I can't remember his last name, but I do remember he had a beautiful wife that was 20 years younger than him. And I thought Walter was an old man at the time, and he was probably 40 years old. <laughs> but, you know, I'm 12, 13 years old, and I would walk down. I'd walk to school in the morning, and then I walked down after school and go. I swept. I did everything. They had a drag strip there as you'd enter. It had a little small front area. The drag strip was along the south wall. Had an oval track uh -huh. up to your left. Then back, it was like too wide. In the corner, they had a beautiful road race track, all 124th. And the interesting part about that is, is that uh, I had an acquaintance that if uh, you were into drag racing, you would know the name called Bob Braverman. Bob Braverman is the first gentleman that came up with the dragster, top fuel dragsters, let's call it, in the slot cars where he took the aluminum rails and machined them mm -hmm. and used the Pittman 85A motors. Okay. <clears throat> and so, and he was a good friend. He wrote for Rod and Custom and he covered slot cars. He also published probably one of the best books that I think has gone through four or five publications about slot cars. And I forget the gentleman's name who wrote it with him, but Bob was a good friend. And another name that came to mind was uh, Yates. There was Don Yates who drove dragsters real dragsters mm -hmm. and he was the first gentleman to go 200 miles an hour on the west coast up at half moon bay although nobody would give him credit because half moon bay supposedly had fast clocks fast yeah but his brother bill yates he made braverman's cars looks like pos's i mean these cars were same type but just took it to a degree he was an engineer and he was just they were fantastic and i had one of his god i wish i had it now so you work on... I work at slot car track. I did everything You were like there. 11, 12? Yeah, I was 12 years old. And then my mom would pick me up because it would get dark. So she would drive me home because... How much did you get paid by the time? Oh. Did they pay I don't anything? even remember. <laughs> I, I was just happy to be there. Oh, I, I did a lot of sweeping. <laughs> we could have like out. five kids. You need me to sweep <laughs> this place. Hey, you need me to sweep this place up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we need to get rid of those leaves or something. <laughs> oh, the there. leaves. Remember, you don't know, but we remove a tree from, 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 from the front of the store. And that tree, I was here when the guy, they, they, they didn't do a good job, by the way. Did they uh, tell you? No. They were holding it with a rope. It still hit the building. I'm surprised they didn't break a window. It shook the building up front. Oh, God. I heard it when they did it. I was here. It was three years ago or something? I'm talking about right now, the guys that did oh, the yeah, tree no, limb. No, no, yeah, that's the, was the same guy. But the, there was another tree right in front of the building. Oh, okay. And that thing, like, you just opened the door, 500 leaves oh, come, come okay, inside. Yeah. And then we decided to cut off and put the artificial grass over there so it can have a That was smart. Clean. Yeah. And don't complain. It's super clean. Come on. So anyway. After a Halloween that, party, it's okay. Oh, no. That was good. But anyway, <laughs> so that was my first job. And then uh, be, through the go-karts, uh, had a couple guys. Ed Hunley worked for my dad, and he worked for... BZ, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Industries, which is a sock car company. I think it was in Torrance. Uh, it might have been because there was Buzzco also. One of them was Torrance, one is El Segundo. Okay. But uh, so anyway, Ed was a great driver, a little guy, so he could run the lightweight classes, which I couldn't because I was always big. I was 6'4", mm -hmm. weighed 190 pounds, and my dad was big, so Ed, Ed worked there. But anyway, and then another gentleman was an engineer at Northrop, Don Burke. And I still have some cars that he made that are just beautiful cars from the, the late 60s, you know, tube chassis, really neat, neat things. But uh, so I ended up racing again, and the Ravel track was up on La Tijera and La Cienega up in Inglewood or L.A., whatever you want to call that area. So you always was you were always involved in slot cars as a no no because I I went through a portion there where I didn't but when I was working for my dad Ravel was just down the street so I'd go there and then the one race that I ran was at uh, oh American International on Hawthorne Boulevard okay I had a dynamic chassis with a 704 motor and it was an open enduro and it was not a team enduro it was a, a single individual and the car wasn't the fastest but it handled good i ended up winning the thing there you go <laughs> yeah i mean because i stayed in it was your first victory well, in go -karts? Car yeah 
now first and only because I just I didn't. I oh, I just got the Halloween enduro, so it well, was, that's right. Was a fifty-year gap over there, but that's, that's fine. That's true. And then what <laughs> happened? The lunch group that I'm part of, the the car guys that we on Wednesday, originally it was Thursday, but we ended up. Uh, one of the guys had been racing all this time, and so Colin and Al. Who you know was out front now. Mm -hmm. uh, Al, they went out there with him and ran the carts at Boyne Park. Uh, carts, excuse me, slot cars at Boyne uh, at Boyne Park Raceway. Well, they didn't ask me to go. I said, "Why didn't you ask me to go?" I go, "I should." I do know this, this thing. <laughs> and so I went with them, and, and I, I had a rental car the first time, and, that, and I bought my I bought a, a Jeff Gordon twenty four car they had with a retro. What was it? The seven or, motor. Or a JK with a. Anyway, and so I that was in December and ran that for a year, and that was 19, and then the pandemic came along and sort of shut down. But the reason I stopped running out there, these guys, we had six of us in the lunch guys. Then we'd go out there on Wednesday because they were closed on Monday and Tuesday. So we moved the lunch group from, used to be Thursday tacos, to Wednesday so we could go out there on Wednesday and, and run. So we went out there every day every Wednesday and sometimes Sundays too. But then the guys, I mean, they'd laugh at you when they take you out. They thought it was funny. I mean, oh, well, you, that's part of racing. Were you bullied? No, anyway, no, that wasn't it. <laughs> because when I race go-karts, okay? Yeah, you cannot do that. If, well, if, we're not, if I, no, no, oh no, I, I, let, me, let me tell you a story about To that. be fair, you're not inside of the slot car. You're I, not inside of the car, so. That's true, but uh. anyway, so, I just, you know, I told these guys, I said, look, when I race go-karts, if I couldn't beat the guy through my skills, I wouldn't beat him. I'm not going to knock him out no, of the yeah, way. No. That just, that's not how I drove it. My dad didn't teach me that way, so I didn't do it. And I go, and you guys thinking this is funny. It's not funny. I mean, sometimes, you know, you end up breaking a motor. You know, they run you in under the bridge and broke axles. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot it, of different it's stuff. It's expensive. But, uh, so anyway... I stopped running with them, and I saw the ad for the Christmas Enduro. Yep. I decided Last to come year, over, right? and I talked. I said, Al, I'm going over there. Why don't you come by? And so we, I stayed the whole time. I was Al had to leave, but I stayed the whole time. And the, the, the two good and fun things about that were I, Eddie was turn marshalling in turn one, and I'd met Eddie out at uh, Boyne Park through Victor. Okay, Dombrowski. Right, Dombrowski. And so I knew who Eddie was because I, I have an interest in old-time radio, and I always listen to it. And I, anyway, I talked to him about that, and I'm sitting behind him. And as I'm sitting there, this guy keeps going, put me in, put me in, put me in. Jim Williams. Yes. Was Jim Williams How racing? You know that? <laughs> and so finally, yeah. I said, I didn't know his name, I said, if you wouldn't come out, they wouldn't have to put you in. Well, I don't see you out here. You get out here. I'll beat your ass. Oh, God. That happened during the yeah. Christmas and there? Yeah, Should that's be what a he celebration. told me. That, no, but that's what he told me. And, and I, if I, I bit my tongue and I said, Jim, I'm going to be out there. But I didn't say it. Okay. And so I, I think almost every time I raced, even when I had my bad experience, I still think I beat him in the Nationals. Okay. <coughs> Although the one race he, he beat me was when uh, I bent the axle. Okay. I finished 24th. All right. But anyway, so uh, that was it. And I started racing here uh, right away, January, and didn't start actually racing till the first race. March. March. Right? Yeah. I didn't run. You canceled the one race. Yes. And then the second race. Because was, we have have some sort of a COVID, well, it was COVID, COVID thing yeah, again. Yeah, COVID right? protocol. Yeah. And the second race was, I want to say, Group 5 or probably, something. Probably. And yeah. F1. F1. Probably, so yeah. I didn't race that. I just didn't feel I was ready. And then I didn't do bad. I didn't do good. And I was really starting to get a little discouraged. And then the race that really turned it around for me was the Trans M race. Really? <clears throat> right. And what had happened, I had a, a Sunoco Come Pioneer on. car that uh, was fast. I was in the 8.0s with it. And so I decided I wanted to clean things up inside. So I was removing the funny wire things on the motor. Yeah. My eyesight isn't that great anymore, and I didn't have my magnifiers on, and I accidentally hit the plastic between the two brass posts, and guess what? The motor had 
nothing anymore. I burned no it up. Power. But the soldering Jeez. iron. So that was my good car. So I ended my... up having to build another car, and I built, got the Smoky Unit car, and that turned out to be a good car. It wasn't quite as fast, but it was consistent. And <laughs> I was in second place going into the last heat, and I was finishing on red, and Carlos Rafael was in third. Uh, and, of course, Chris Sukimoto with his uh, washing machine car that made so much noise was long gone. But, yeah, but, he, but won. Yeah. Oh, he won it. So all still I'm have figuring the is— He still have the track record. Yeah. He won't, though. Trust me. Yeah, I know. So— Well, one year of development. That that race was in March. Now we're almost in, we're in well, November. I made, I made a deal with a, a person we'll, we'll name later quickly. But anyway, so what? <laughs> no, okay. No, but I'm saying so. I figured, you know what? I'm a lap up on him. All I have to do is turn nines, and if he turns eight fifty, he won't catch me. Yeah. So I, I stayed in the whole time in red, didn't come out. But my times weren't nine. I had nobody telling me what I was turning. I was turning nine five, the fastest. So that means I was turning some tens. And guess what? He beat me by a, less than a two two tenths of a lap. And that taught me one Shoot, thing. Dance. Going slow, don't cut it. <laughs> don't cut it. It's a race. By the end of the day, it's a race. <laughs> but you don't want to go eight tenths. you got to go nine tenths. nine tenths. So anyway, as a result of that, I finished third. And I had a good race in one of the heats against Rick Jockham. And I beat him. He who not to be named. It. He right. the named uh, gentleman. Now. <laughs> so that was interesting. So e even though we didn't do much, I just... He seemed like a good guy, and we had a good time in that heat where we ra I mean, we're probably two, yeah, two minutes of the three minutes we were racing. I know that you guys started a good relationship over there. We did, but sharing, what sharing really, stuff and really formed the relationship was the next F1 race because he's here, and he's running, and, and I'm calling out his times. I'm saying, you know what? Maybe you need to uh, try some oil on those tires. And he goes, no, I don't want to do that. I go, just try the NSR oil and put it on the track. He picked up two tenths. Yeah. And then I said, why don't you play with the screws a little bit? And I guess he said, no, nah. I go, try loosen them up a little just bit. Just try, yeah. Here. He tried them, and he picked up like another two tenths. So now his car is fast. So that sort of I remember, I think I think I set up that car for him. You did, actually. Yeah, it was a former uh, Ayrton Senna Camo, yellow car. Yeah. So anyway, that sort of helped. And then, I don't know, we just seemed to hit it off. Uh, and so we formed Jab Racing. There you go. Jockham and Baines. And actually, that th the reason it's Jab or not BJ was because he goes, <laughs> he said BJ. And I said, wait a second. No. That ain't going to work. <laughs> yeah. So it's Jab, which happens to be my youngest son's initials, plus, Joseph Andrew Baines. Plus a Jab in a competition. Yeah. No, <laughs> there exactly. You go. But, and it's just, it, you know, it, it seemed to work. We also, uh, when we went up to Motown, he went up on a, a one day, uh, which was a mistake, but he, he drove up in the morning and came back at night. Ugh. And the funniest thing about that is he wanted to go up there Saturday. And I said, no, I've got this cold and I'm trying to fight it. I don't want to do 10 hours of driving. That's not going to help. So he didn't. And the best thing about it was he got to come here on Saturday. And as a result, you know, he didn't know you were going to be open. I did. I said, why don't you go there? But the bad part about that is uh, I let him try my Trans M car. And on white, he ended up turning a 788. And the record is 793 on, on yellow. black. Oh, yeah. No, I think it's black, if it's I black, remember right. Black, probably. Black or yellow. For, no, you're right. It's yellow, probably. It is yellow because Chris slowed down in the race, just played it safe. Chris good friend now because he races up at Big Lou's. Yeah. So, in fact, the that car, for some reason, uh, rumor has it by Kevin Tabucci okay. that that car probably wouldn't pass tech if you pulled the body off. We can, okay, so now well, I have to anyway, ask. Oh, no, God. I'm just saying. So anyway, More Chris work. has got no. Chris has got a new car, and he and I. I told Chris I've been kidding him the whole time since that race. I go, you're gonna have to help me with the Trans M. Well, his new car will only do 8.4. He can't get it going. And, I mean, I was able to do a, an 8.04 on white. And then when uh, Rick did the 7.88 and he heard about that, he goes, you need to help me. I said, well, what do you need? I'll tell you. 
Yeah. But so oh, anyway. that's that's another thing. You guys have been great with for everybody. Everybody here to be helping and sharing information. I think you are kind of the core of the group, you and, and Rick, because we've been winning, we've been racing on top. And if somebody has any questions for you, going to say right away, there's no games or anything like that. And I really appreciate this part of it. And I know that you guys are helping other people, new people like Tim Fleener and other people like who've come about, with a lot of doubts. How about uh, Dan Fouts? Which is a new guy who's He's coming, He's a guy right? that yeah. raced 132nd out of Buena Park yeah, with uh, yeah. Greg and... Uh, uh, Chris Coddington, Boyd's sons, and I guess he's very successful out there, but I came to the track last week. He was here, and he's working on his car, and I sat down, got my controller, and before I could, he goes, you know, I'm new. I go, could you answer a question for me? Next thing I know, I'm putting his car together. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. He, Trust he, me, I know. How, how no, no, I, but I'm just saying, but, you know, that's okay. So he's I, coming with Boyd's uh, son? Yeah, Boyd's son's uh Chris still does the wheels, uh, hot rod by boy wheels. He's keeping that legacy alive. I know that he's coming with someone. Is that the guy who's coming with? Oh, no. that's uh, I, he, He's another racer from Buena Park. I okay. uh, forget his name, but he hasn't even run here yet, so he's going to be hurting it. Those guys are very optimistic because oh. he, he bought everything and he came. Christian wasn't here, so I was ringing him up on my computer. And he was sitting down where you are. And then he had to call to the other guy. I can't remember the name too. And the guy Bob was something. Bob. Bob. He was giving his credit card number, and the bill was like eight hundred bucks. And this, and the, then say, oh, it's eight hundred bucks. And the guy over the phone say, oh well, we're gonna beat them anyway. So they're very optimistic for a guy who never been here. Well, the funny thing is, as a result <laughs> of that, and the car that I did for him, I mean, right out of the shoot, I ran it ten laps and did a seven six. And I said, this car is capable of going a second faster because the tires aren't true. I mean. You know, so anyway, and he has got it in the fours now because I worked on a little more for him. Uh, he's been coming up here twice now, and he did get down to six four with the car. So that's very competitive for the yeah. uh, group five. Group five class. But uh, so last time, as I'm getting ready to go, he goes, uh, "I got a question for." You. I go, "Yeah, what's that?" He goes, uh, "Would you mind building a GT40 for the Enduro?" I go, "No, we I do that." Yeah, sure. they're they're enrolled for the Enduro too. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, but uh, you know what? <laughs> My motto has always been, uh, goes back to Inglewood Cart. My dad had a very good worth ethic, ethic based upon the fact he was a policeman and had the business he's operating, which I feel I had too, the same, same ethic. But yeah. <clears throat> having said that, it's just you always treated the customer right. The customer always came first. We'd be at the go-kart track, and a customer would have a problem, Either my dad or me would go help them fix it. And at the detriment of our race, because that was time we couldn't spend on our cart, but we helped the customer. And that's why we had such a good reputation. Because the gentleman that bought it afterwards worked for my dad for several years and bought the business, Jerry Freckleton. He made the mistake. He forgot about those Christmas sales of fun carts uh, and, and mini bikes. And he moved the business out to Corona in an industrial area. What well, nobody driving nobody by there is going to see it. So when we had him in the sh display area, people saw him off street and stopped. Well, and would like buy Tina Turner. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So he didn't get those sales, which hurt the business. But worse yet, his son started racing. And when his son raced, his son came first. Well, he lost his customer base, and Inglewood Card is gone from oh. the scene because he, he just couldn't keep going. Yeah. He didn't understand that concept. Did you have a good time when the DeLorean rolled in? Oh, the DeLorean. You know what? I wasn't really into it, but yeah, I appreciated it. <laughs> well, I the, kids, they, the kids went crazy. Oh, right? it was great for them. That's why I appreciated it, because it, it sort of fit in. The whole idea of that 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 uh, Halloween party was we bring people in, they try the track, they have the little party going on, the, the store is dark, it's pretty cool, we have lights on the cars, and suddenly we stop the track and have the pros racing. And those are the best drivers we have because it's based on, on the points. driver's championship, on the points. I still can't believe you did that email, email that people oh, didn't oh, understand. Oh. Well, it's it's right in the rules. You can read it very simple. Yeah, and the whole year we're talking about, look, you need to be in the, the sixth. It's just because people people like you and Rick were both... Uh, well, we both could add teams. Yes, but you could race together. So we start to go right. down to down the, the list. And then when people saw people on 8th or 9th going or to like the race, and said, why are you not racing? Yeah. yeah, because you're further down the list. It's obvious. Or nobody yeah. wanted to partner with you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm glad that you guys are here. I'm glad that you guys did that race. And uh, I think we're going to 
I think the, the way that I set up the calendar is pretty fun with the swap meets and the nationals. The and swap the, meet was great because to tell you the truth, up until uh, last Saturday, the car Rick was going to run was a swap meet by a there 69 go. scale electric. Uh, there you go. And he bought one for me and my car wasn't as fast as his. But then what I didn't finish telling you was is that uh, I ended up with that car that he bought, the yellow 69 Camaro, and my car is missing. So he's okay. got my car because of running car. that fast. So. And I won't get it back. He says he thinks it'll show up uh, after the race. Well, we know that Rick uh, nowadays is not feeling well, right? You know that, right? Because he's 0 0.003 slower than me. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> he brought that up, Rick. I'm going to make a T-shirt. The reason I'm that he's... going to have a T-shirt. The, the reason that he's not happy is because <laughs> I took him out... You took him out. <laughs> ...in the LMP race on the second oh, lap yeah, where I was, was fighting him for the lead, which was neat fun. for me since he... Ever since I beat him in the Can-Am race, he's beat me. I can't beat him. He but that's not because to be it. he's probably... One of the top three guys in the country when it comes to his reactions and whatever. Yeah. And I'm a 73 year old man trying to compete with a 61 <laughs> year old guy. Well, we're teaming up with him in the winning races, so it's fine for you too. Well, it, it is, but you know, he's what? a hell of a race. He's so fast. <clears throat> it was he fun. Is he is fast, but the best part is, is that at the nationals, he ended up running my car that I set up. Because his car wasn't as fast. <laughs> there you go. So that's the partnership. That's the beauty of it. Exactly. So you're sharing stuff. We are. And I this time I didn't really want to share stuff because I got to 8 0 on white. <laughs> and he and, took your and car. He took my car. But you know what? He doesn't know this yet. Today I went to 7976 with my new car that I had to build. There you go. So there you go. with me driving that fast to get within a tenth of him, that car is faster than his. Than so his he's car. got a problem. Oh, yeah. He's very, very fast. He is fast. And that, point you know zero, what? Point zero, zero 0.003 is lower than me, but very fast. <laughs> <laughs> Walter, thank Marco. you. Marco. <laughs> thank you very much. I don't oh. think I don't think I can beat him in a race. Like he's constant fast. It's 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 Well, it's that's that's shoot. why we won the race, because he did two heats where he never came off. Yeah. I did one. But he did two. And he did two. No, I, I think I can do that too, but the thing is the rhythm. The pace is fast and fast and fast he, and fast and fast. I know it. And his times, the worst thing in that race, not to, to regress, is I prepared the tires, as you told everybody, for the cars. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very and much we, for that. Well, you're welcome. I, 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 After testing that car for two laps and seeing it had no traction, there's no way I wanted to yeah. do an enduro like that. So yeah, I, I didn't I mind it. But for some reason, when we got yellow, the tires or that car was not ready to race. That car, I could barely get in sixes, and Rick just wasn't as fast until probably the last two minutes of the race. So we had the fewest number of laps on yellow of anybody. We had the most laps on four of the other lanes, and on black we had the second, but that car just wouldn't kick in. So that's probably the tires I did from 2.30 to 3 at night. <laughs> the last the last. It bit me shift. in the butt. <laughs> the last ones. Yeah. But Walter, thank you very much again, and thank you for doing what you're doing here, like putting this group together and helping people out. And even when it's a play, it's fun. Like I, yeah. I did that at my dad's, like I said, in the go karts, <laughs> and they were customers, and they, they aren't my customers. But I, I don't know. I sort of feel attached. That's why I'd like to talk to Scott. Yeah. Maybe I could do something. Of course but you can. Anyway, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much, man. <laughs> thank you, and have your arm get better. Oh God. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Remember, you got a race. I hope oh, yeah. you're right-handed. Are you right-handed? Okay. Am, am, okay.